John chapter 20, verses 11 to 18. Title of today's sermon comes straight out of the passage, Why Are You Crying? That's the title of today's sermon. Let me just read the passage for us, verses 11, starting at verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They, Why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Women, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your, fa uh, and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. Amen. Before I go into um, today's sermon, I'm actually going to ask um, James and Chanu could come up and help me, and then maybe Alan, you can come up and help me. It's just that I think I love looking at these beautiful flowers, but um, we want to push it back a little bit. Maybe what, what we can do is, can we put this here? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, let's put it on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I initially, am I going to be able to see your faces? Okay, good. Okay, then I can see your faces. Yeah, not that I'm trying to check that if you're falling asleep or not. <laughs> But some of you are blocked in my view, so um, I wanted you to be able to see me as much as the flowers are amazing and beautiful. All right. Friends, He is risen. Amen? He is risen. Amen. Amen. So today, I need a lot of amen. Amen. So Let's just do it one more time. You know, let's get this going. Get your vocal cord going, you know. Diaphragm opened up. He is risen. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I haven't been dressing up for EC lately, but I pull out my suit again for you. And the suit is not the important part. The tie is. I put on my special tie for Easter Sunday. Be Sunday. Another occasion on which I put on my pink tie is when I officiate wedding ceremonies. So at least, I mean, it's not that, you know, now don't, you know, tell me like if I put the pink one on again, you're like, you said only on Easter. Other Sundays I do it too, but make sure that I always put the pink tie on on Easter Sunday. That's kind of become my tradition for me, personal tradition um, at One Hope. And I'll tell you why I do this. This is my way of getting ready for Easter Sunday. It's just a way for me to tell myself that this is a special day, a different day. As much as all the other Sundays are special, this is also very special so that right from the start of the day, I put this tie on and do something new that's different from previous Sunday to tell myself, right, this is Easter Sunday. For our KC service, we meet at a school. So I parked uh, a little bit further away from the school in the morning, and I started walking towards the school. And I started hearing, you know, as you can see, it's a beautiful spring day, spring Easter Sunday. So unlike other, you know, Sundays previously, I started to hear the birds chirping and singing. And then I'm like, yes, Easter Sunday, the choir. Beautiful birds singing this beautiful song unto the Lord, celebrating the Lord's resurrection. And as I was thinking about this and getting all, you know, fuzzy and lovey-dovey, you know, all these feelings coming over me, and then all of a sudden I hear another bird just singing into this beautiful song. God! God! <laughs> I'm like, okay. On other Sundays, you know, because in certain cultures, crows are considered like, you know, negative, right? Not so positive. But at least I'm thinking, okay, it's Easter Sunday. So even the crows, not to this crows, but even you're calling, you're part of the celebration. 
So I heard it as the crow. You know, you can picture one of those, you know, if you're not one of those people that are very confident about your singing, right, as we gather together, maybe you can see yourself that way too. But you still, it doesn't matter if you can't sing well. You're so excited about the Lord's resurrection. You're just going, He is risen. Go, go. He is risen. Go, go. And I included the crows in this choir today because it is the Lord's resurrection day. What a beautiful and awesome, amazing day. And why do I do this, friends? Why do I do this? Because I believe in the resurrection. And as your fellow brother in Christ and as your pastor, I don't want to just speak about resurrection on this day, but I want to show how I feel about my Lord's resurrection. And that's why I do it. But there's another reason why I do this. It's because as I meditated through um, the idea or this, uh, this amazing event of the Lord's resurrection, the Lord put it on my heart that we as followers of Christ, the enemy will never be able to steal our resurrection in the future, but the enemy can and does steal our resurrection faith in the present. So I don't want my enemy to rob me of my resurrection joy. Yes, my resurrection is guaranteed in the future, but this resurrection faith in the present moment, the enemy can steal it away from me, and I don't want it to be taken away. So right from the morning when I get up, actually it started all week, but more so from Saturday night, the night before Easter Sunday, I'm protecting my heart. I'm guarding my heart. In fact, on Saturday, a couple things happened that just made me feel like, oh, you know, I don't want to get into this mode of Resurrection Sunday. But I push through and I just keep going. And come Sunday morning, where is my pink tie? Where is my resurrection tie? There it is. Put it on. Nothing, no one shall steal my resurrection joy on this day. That's why I do it. Church plant, as a church plant pastor, it was so easy for me to get caught up in thinking about what we don't have. Because when you plant the church, it's like you see so many things that you think you should have, but you don't have. So you, you keep thinking about these things. But one day, the Lord showed me, ask a different question. And that question was this. Yes, it's nice to have those things, but think about the things that you must have because we're a God's community. Rather than dwelling on what you don't have yet, and as I wrestled through and kept thinking about it over and over again, God brought me to the gospel. Yes, we, don't have, we can't, we love to have some of these other things, but it's not a must. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is a must. So I've been focusing on the gospel ever since day one. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news of Jesus Christ. But if we expand it and unfold it, there are four parts to the good news of Jesus Christ. And these four are must. What are they? The cross, the resurrection, the ascension, and return of our Lord Jesus Christ. These four things. And I test you. What are those four things again? Number one, the cross. You know, right? Don't disappoint me here. So the cross, and then what? The resurrection. That was easy, right? The cross, resurrection, ascension, and return of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to have these four things to fully understand what the gospel is. And the creed. I don't know if you think about this every time you sing it each week, but that's basically what the creed is about. These four things, as we were reminded today, right? We have to have these four things for the gospel to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus died on the cross on our behalf for us, and he paid for our sin by dying on that cross. Hallelujah. Amen. Every time I say hallelujah, you can follow it up by saying amen. 
And this Jesus who died on the cross didn't remain in the grave or in the tomb, but he rose from the dead, and by rising from the dead, he defeated sin and death. Hallelujah. Amen. And this Jesus didn't remain here on earth, but he ascended into heaven, sat on the, on the right hand of the Father, and now he sits on the throne as king, and he's ruling and reigning over everything in the universe. Hallelujah. Amen. And this Jesus who is sitting on the throne in heaven, he will come back when the time comes. And he will bring in the kingdom to fulfillment. And God's kingdom will become complete and completely fulfilled in the world. Hallelujah. Amen. These four go together. And out of these four, resurrection, I would put it this way, is the linchpin that holds the others together. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what is the cross but a nice gesture? At most, without the resurrection, what is the cross of Jesus but a beautiful sacrifice? At most, right? The reason why the cross becomes the power of God for us is because, not just because he died on the cross. Again, if he didn't rise, okay, thank you. You sacrificed for me. That was nice. But the reason why this becomes powerful for us is because Jesus rose from the dead. And when we receive Jesus, we are united with Christ. And not only do we die with Jesus, we rise with him as well. That's why resurrection makes the cross of Jesus God's power. Without the resurrection, ascension of Christ is impossible. He's still in the tomb. Without the resurrection, he cannot ascend into heaven. So without the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus is simply just a nice idea. It will be cool if we can ascend and sit on the throne and be king, but it will just be a nice idea. Without the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, his second coming will be nothing but a false hope. How can you put trust in someone that says that will come back if he didn't even rise from the dead and he's still dead in the grave? This is how important resurrection is. Going back to today's passage, Mary is at the tomb of Jesus. And in this passage, this word is repeated many times, the word to cry. She's crying. Verse 11, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, as she cried, she bent over to look into the, temp, temp, uh, into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they have put him. Why is she crying? But because she's thinking somebody stole the body of Jesus. And by that, what she can read into is, is the fact that perhaps someone actually um, damaged his body. And in that culture, to have something done or have your body damaged and, you know, after you die is considered dishonor and shame. So she wanted to at least go and take good care of the body of Jesus, even though he is dead. Verse 14, she turns around and sees Jesus. But she doesn't realize that it's Jesus. So Jesus asks her again, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? And she says, thinking that this is the gardener, she says to Jesus, well, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I'll get him. Why? Because I want, my, I want to keep and protect the body of my Lord Jesus Christ. So she sees Jesus but doesn't recognize him. So she asks him, if you took the body away, Please, let me know. I'll go get it. Put the bombs on that body. I'll take care of this body of Jesus. In this woman, we see a picture of beautiful, uh, a picture of loyalty, love, devotion. Even after death, that she did not abandon Christ, but she went to the tomb and she wanted to show that love and devotion to the end, beyond the end to Jesus. 
But I'm getting to the main point here. As much as this is a beautiful picture of devotion, love, and faithfulness, without resurrection, that's as far as she can go. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's as far as she can go. What I mean is, as far as she can go is the place where she goes and cries before the body of Christ and body of Jesus. And that's all she can do if there's no resurrection. And our faith journey is the same. It's like that too. Without the resurrection of Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, we could only go as far as just going and crying and shedding tears and having our hearts aching, broken over things that happen in our lives. But we cannot go beyond the tears if there is no resurrection. But we can go beyond our tears because our Lord Jesus Christ indeed rose from the dead. And because of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we don't have to just cry anymore. We can turn our tears into moments of clinging on to our hope, future hope. We don't have to let our tears just keep us in agony and sorrow. In the midst of our tears, we could also hold on to and find hope because of our Lord's resurrection. We see this at work in Psalm 126 where we see both. Psalm 126 verses 1 to 3 is the first part of this psalm, and it goes something like this. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. And many say that this is a psalm, and these verses are looking back at the return of the exile. You know how the Israelites were exiled into Babylon, but God brought them back to the land, Jerusalem. Joyful, amazing day when God brought them back and restored their fortunes back to Jerusalem. But even though they had come back, verse 4 shows us things were not all perfect. So they cry out again, restore our fortunes, Lord. Verse 5, those who sow with tears, it says. Even though God... It was not perfect. There was still hardship and suffering waiting. And in that suffering and hardship, they start to cry again and weep again. Friends, isn't this like our Christian life? Through Jesus Christ, we were brought out of our Babylon back to the promised land of salvation. And we thought after we receive Jesus, receive Jesus, everything is going to be perfect and swell and everything's going to be fine. And yet, even after we are saved, we experience tears, hardship, suffering, and struggle. Things don't always become perfect, even though we have become Christian. We trip over our sin, and as a result of that, we cry because we see our shortcomings. We carry, perhaps some of us, our condition that we have. You thought maybe we were coming back, coming to Jesus and being saved, maybe this condition will disappear. But for some of us, we carry that to the rest of our lives. Wounds that we had received. Now that Jesus is in my life, that it will disappear, but it continues to hurt us. And we keep weeping, even though we are now saved. But then what has changed? What has changed, even if our tears are still there? What has changed? is that because of our Lord's resurrection, our tears are no longer a waste. 
Look at what the verse says. Verse 5. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Because of our Lord's resurrection, our tears now become an act of sowing. Sowing hope. We're not just crying because it's painful. We're not just crying because it's so hopeless. But when we do cry and tears flow because we believe and know that Jesus rose from the dead and that one day we will rise from the dead, our tears become seeds of hope that we sow. And God doesn't let our tears go to waste. He promises those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying abundant sheaves of harvest with them. Tears that we shed because of our Lord Jesus Christ and His resurrection is no longer a waste, but it becomes our worship unto Him. Why? Because when we cry, now even in our midst of in our pain and sorrow, we still hold on to the hope of our Lord's resurrection and our resurrection, and we put our trust in that resurrection. And because of that, our tears, because of pain that overflows from us, is no longer a waste, but it becomes an act of worship to God. And as we sow the seeds of hope through our tears, God receives it and he turns it into his own works, ministry in this world. That's what's changed. I don't guarantee and promise that just because you now believe in Jesus and He's your Lord and Savior, that everything will be perfect. We will at times. I pray and hope that you don't. But at times, we will go through hardship. We will go through suffering. We will go through pain. And what has changed, however, is that our tears that we shed, when we cry, when we weep, is no longer a waste. Because we're not just shedding tears anymore. When we do, with the hope of our resurrection, what we're doing is we're sowing, sowing seeds, seeds of God's hope and His work. So our takeaway for today on our Resurrection Sunday is this. Resurrection turns our tears into a seed of hope. On Friday night, we had our joint service with the Grove Church, and it was a wonderful time of just gathering together, but we did our rehearsal, you know, before the service start time, just wanted to make sure, you know, mic sounds good, the volume's good, and then just about 10 minutes before the start time, as I always do, I just go, go, went back to my office, and as I'm going into my office, and then, you know, ho grab the doorknob and try to turn the doorknob and go in, um, from my, um, this side of my eye, I catch one of the group members that I know, and we've talked and said hi before, and he was coming towards uh, me, and I just turned and turned my head and said, hello, how are you, and all this, and he said hi, but then when I, as soon as I said, how are you, he walked up to me and said, well, I have cancer. So no longer just looking like looking at him like this, I turned my body towards him and I put my hand on his shoulder and said, if it's okay, could you tell me a little bit more? And then he talked about how he went for a checkup, you know, a couple of weeks ago and he heard the news and now he's going through the whole process now of surgery and all these things. I encouraged him. This is a moment when we hold on to the gift of faith that God has given to us. And he told me that, you know, I saw my doctor, and this is what I told him. I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God will use your hand 
to do the work of doctor. Just because we believe in Jesus doesn't mean that we're, we, are, we escape all the life's hardship and difficulties. We face them too. But what changes is that we see it differently. And because we see it differently, we walk through it differently. Yes, we cry too. We Christians cry, we weep. But what's different, what has changed, is that our tears are no longer a waste. When you are shedding tears over your fellow friend in Christ, your parents, your children, that tear becomes a ministry. And God receives those tears, and he begins his work, his work of resurrection. I don't know what you're weeping over these days, but if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, I want you to know those tears are not a waste, not a waste. You're sowing seeds. Seeds of hope, seeds of resurrection. So I encourage you, I encourage you to cling on to that hope because that's all we've got. But that's okay. That's all we need, isn't it? I'm going to invite the praise team to come back up. And on this Resurrection Sunday, we want to Declare this truth and kingdom that's broken into our lives. That we weep and cry just like everyone else. But we also at the same time now sow our tears as seeds of hope. What are you crying about and weeping over these days? Maybe yourself your parents, your children, your friends, your situation, as you weep, know that it's not a waste in Jesus. So let's continue to sow our seeds of hope together as we sing. Let's sing it together.